I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet were standing within the gates of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city and is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to give thanks to the name of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Make it prosper, love you. Peace be within your walls, and security within your towers. For the sake of my relatives and friends, I will say, Peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Please be seated. The reading today is found in Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, found on page 25 of the New Testament in your Pew Bible. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones who are sent to it, how often have I desired to gather your children together as hens gather her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Well, good morning. Uh, this morning I'd like to do the second part of sharing from our ex recent experience in the Holy Land. Uh, last week we spoke about the time that Jesus spent up in the northern part of uh, Israel, up in the Galilee region. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about Jesus' time in the city of Jerusalem. You may recall uh, from last week I compared the nation of Israel to roughly the, the state of New Hampshire saying that it's about, uh, about the same size and about the same shape as the state of New Hampshire, that in the very north of the Galilee region where Pittsburgh, New Hampshire would be, there's Mount Hermon, a very, very high mountain that is snow covered. The snows melt on the top of Mount Hermon and they flow down, forming the River Jordan that flows into the Sea of Galilee. And then the Jordan River flows out of the Sea of Galilee down along the, the Jordan River Valley into the Dead Sea. Uh, the city of Jerusalem is roughly somewhere between Manchester and Concord, if you were to approximate it on, on the map, maybe just a little bit to the east of that. And here's a picture of the, uh, the city of Jerusalem. It's, as you can see, it's a very vibrant, large, modern city. The population, I think, is about five million people live in the city of Jerusalem. New York is about seven million, I think, so it's a, it's a pretty good-sized metropolitan area. The city of Jerusalem was an ancient Canaanite city that David conquers in the year about 1000 BCE and makes that the capital of, of Jerusalem. And uh, that big dome you see there is the Dome of the Rock. That's one of the holiest sites for the nation of Islam. There was a time when uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, there's an Islamic period when the city is ruled by, by Islam and they create, created that, that dome then. So, Lynn, could you advance the slide? That's Kathy riding a camel. <laughs> I want you to know I did have her permission before I put it up there. Okay, you can advance the slide. This is probably where we both had the most spiritual experience that we had at our time in Israel. That's the Western Wall. That's the only part of the ancient temple that is still standing. And it's really not a part of the ancient temple, but it's more of a retaining wall around the foundation of the temple. Uh, in 70 AD, when the Romans conquer Jerusalem, they completely destroy the temple. 
and that's all that's left. And you'll see across the base of the wall, there are people who go, and they go there for prayer. And every day, there's, there's a, always a line of people um, to go there for prayer. And that was the most moving for me when, uh, when we went there to just stand there and think of the centuries that people have gone there where they have prayed, they have sought God's grace, God's mercy, and God's guidance. And I uh, was very, very moved. Um, the practice is to write your prayer petitions out on a piece of paper and then stuff them into the cracks and the crevices of the wall as a way, as a way of praying. I understand there's even a service now. You can fax your prayer request and someone will go and stick it in the wall for you for a fee. <laughs> <laughs> But it, but it really was incredibly moving to, to be there. Um, people were very expressive as they stood at the wall and they would, some would cry and some would move quite uh, expressively. One person was even rubbing his face up against the wall almost like a cat would do. And it was very, very moving to see, to see the intensity of people's prayers. Would you advance it, Lynn? This is the uh, temple as it was in Jesus' lifetime. This is the, the temple that was reconstructed. Uh, in 586, the nation of Israel is conquered by the Babylonians. The temple is destroyed. And then Herod rebuilds it. And this is the temple as Herod rebuilt it. Now, if you look down at the bottom left-hand corner you can just barely see part of a, a set of steps. Those are the southern steps or the, the they're called the, the teaching steps or the rabbi steps. Often that's where rabbis would teach. It's the southern end of the, of the temple. Those who are coming to Jerusalem for the first time would come up the, up the mountain and would be greeted there by the rabbis who would greet them and offer their instruction. If you look above those steps, you'll see the dark, the red colored roof. Those are actually, those were probably the office areas for the uh, religious professionals who worked in the temple during that day. The, the scribes and the Sadducees would work there. And if you notice, there's a, there's a passage in Matthew's gospel where Jesus speaks woe to the religious leaders and if you look at the way it's constructed in Matthew, Jesus is speaking those woes on those teaching steps. And right above the steps are the office complexes of the very people that he is um, chastising for their, their religious abuses. The large chunk in the middle is the Holy of Holies. That would be where on Yom Kippur the, the priests would offer the sacrifices. And if you look to the left, to your right hand corner up there in the, the towers on the far side, that's the Antonia Fortress. During the Roman period, uh, it was not customary for non-Jewish people to go into the temple, which made the Roman authorities rather nervous. So they construct this fortress there so they can go up to the top and look in and see what's happening in the temple in order to maintain uh, their rule and their, their authority over it. And if you look down to the, I can't really point to it, um, the corner closest to us, that's probably the highest point of the temple And at that very corner, there was a block that said, trumpeter, stand here. And that was probably the part where someone would stand to uh, blow the trumpet to announce something for the ancient city. That's also the highest point of the temple, the pinnacle of the temple. If we recall the temptation story, that's the spot where uh, in the story, Jesus and the Satan talk where the temptation comes. Um, down below to the left of that, 
uh, that tower, you see that ancient road that's recently been uncovered. When the Romans sacked the temple, they destroyed it. And it looks as if they tossed all the rubble from, from that side forward, which would be to your left. And uh, recently they've excavated that and they've pulled up all of that rubble. And you can actually get down to what could very well have been the first century road. The, it's probably about the only place in Israel where you could legitimately say, I walked today where Jesus walked, because most of where Jesus walked is about 60 feet below, because over the years, the, 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 the grounds build up, and that's where you have to go to excavate for that time period. So that's a picture of the ancient temple. It is the largest building by far in the city. And so when Jesus puts himself in opposition to the temple, he really is standing against the strongest, biggest, most powerful institution of, of his lifetime. And also in the writing of the Gospels, by the time Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written, this temple has already been destroyed by the Romans. And so if you, if you caught, as Steve read the, read the passage, um, your city is desolate. During the writing of the Gospels, this temple has already been destroyed and is already desolate. So I hope we can hold that picture in our minds, particularly through Holy Week as we retell the story of Jesus' last, uh, last week of his life. Much happens in and around this temple. Lynn, if you would. This is, uh, that's a much better picture than I had, Lynn. <laughs> this is what uh, is identified as the upper room. That would be where um, Jesus has the Last Supper with his disciples. It's probably not as the room was in the first century. This seems to be much later, probably around eight or 900. Um, it is the... Uh, probably a Byzantine construction if you look at the arches. It's, it's not a first century building, but much, much later. Um, and just below this upper room, there is the tomb of David, where, where the ancient king is buried. And there's a marvelous tree, if you see it on the left of the slide there. Um, it's not really a tree, it's an artistic creation. And uh, there are three branches symbolizing that the city of Jerusalem is home to both Ju Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And it is a means of prayer, reminding each practitioner of each faith to be peaceful, to be loving, and to live up to the highest ideals of each faith as they coexist in that rather small, uh, small area. Lynn, if you would. This is the, the Mount of Olives the Garden of, and the Garden of Gethsemane. Those are olive trees that populate this whole grove. Um, when I was there 22 years ago, the tour guide said, these are the very trees that were, that were there when Jesus lived. I was a little suspect, but. <laughs> but it's probably not much different than it would have been during Jesus' lifetime. Um, ancient trees planted pretty evenly. And uh, one of the things that strikes me about the story of um, the Garden of Gethsemane and the light that Jesus is arrested is really how easily it would have been for Jesus to have escaped had he chose to. Um, it's very, not very clear, it's not very open. Jesus could have dipped in and out of the shadows very quickly and made his escape from the Roman army that came to the temple guard that came to arrest him, but he chose not to do that. Gethsemane literally means the olive press. And so when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane, he is quite literally being pressed. The weight of the empire is crushing down upon him. It will kill him. He will die. And yet, 
something of great value will be extracted from his death. So the garden, the olive press at the Garden of Gethsemane is a good spiritual uh, metaphor for us when we go through our hard times, when we go through difficult seasons, to know that there is purpose that can carry us through our time of suffering and our times of difficulty. Lynn? This is the church at the, uh, I can never say it in Latin, so I'll just, say it in, I'll just say it in English. It's the house of the, it's built on the place of the house of the high priest. That would be where Jesus would have been taken after he was arrested in the, uh, on the Mount of Olives. Um, it's about 2,000 steps from where Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane to this house of the high priest where, according to the Gospels, Jesus is brought before, uh, brought before the high priest. Lynn, if you would. That's a picture of the uh, dungeons underneath the church, the dungeons that probably were in place during the time that Jesus is arrested. They're nothing more than a cave with no way in or no way out except a, a hole in the ceiling. When one was uh, incarcerated there, you probably would have had a rope tied around your torso, lowered, and you'd be lowered into this pit where you would stay until the person who put you there wants you out. And um, we walked around down there and it was quite ominous and, and to, think of, to think of what that night of imprisonment for Jesus would have been um, in a pit, no way out, no light, just there awaiting. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's owned by uh, five different churches. Uh, a couple of Orthodox churches own it, the Roman Catholic Church owns it, and a few others, the Armenian churches, I'm not sure which ones. Um, they could never, ever, ever agree. <laughs> so actually, is a, a Muslim group owns it now. <laughs> and they, uh, they maintain order on it, and uh, they're the ones who keep it open. Um, but it was constructed probably around 300 AD. And uh, if you look up above, you can see something under the window. I can't really point it out, but actually it's a ladder. One of the workmen, when they were rebuilding the, the church around the time that uh, it became the owner of these five denominations, these five churches, the workmen had left the ladder there. And as a part of the meeting, the agreement was that nothing would ever be changed. And so the ladder left by the workmen has remained ever since. And it's one of the things that can't be changed. So that's why there's a ladder to that window. <laughs> and if you could advance it again, Lynn. This is the inside of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, it's one of the places we believe may have been the site of the crucifixion and the entombment and the resurrection. And it's a very ornate inner chapel. And if you look under it, um, there's a sort of a window down into, uh, into where, the, where the crucifixion may have been. And if you could advance it again, Lynn. This is the garden tomb. That's the other possibility. We really don't know for sure where all these places, all these things took place. During the, the first century, there was no, uh, no reason to highlight it because the religion hadn't been founded and this, the, the importance of these places were not yet uh, clear. So they're trying to reconstruct it probably, uh, you know, three or 400 years after the fact. So this is the garden tomb, probably more likely the spot. It's uh, outside of what, what would have been the ancient city limits, and you would not have had a crucifixion within the city limits. Uh, it's near a, near a high rock, and it just seems to line up with much of what we know from the gospel stories. Um, if you see on the front of the tomb, um, there's a, 
It's a track. You see, you see the doorway to the tomb, the main entrance. Yeah, right there. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, that would have been a place where a stone carved and made um, for the purpose would roll. It would be a track for a rolling stone. So you would roll a large stone over the opening of the tomb to close it. And so when we read in the gospel, I think it's in the gospel of uh, one of the gospels, when the women go to the tomb, they're asking, who will roll the stone away for us? It's rolling a round stone that looks more like a wheel off from the tomb. And that's the inside of the garden tomb. As you... Uh, as you enter the garden tomb, there's one room that's immediately in front of you, and then there are two uh, rooms off to the, off to the right as you, as you enter in. And the rooms are open, you can see into them. And that probably was the model for how tombs would have been constructed. So when Mary looks into the tomb, she would look in Probably the, the, the opening room would have been empty and Mary is off, off to the right. And that, the way the story unfolds, that makes sense in, in the gospel. And then one more. And that's Kathy coming up out of the tomb. <laughs> so, someone asked if Kathy was dressed like that for religious purposes or for customary purposes, but that's not true. You were just cold, right? <laughs> it was cold and rainy, yeah. So... So anyway, those are some of the photos I wanted to share with you and some of our experiences that we had in the Holy Land. I, I really would ask you to try to hold those images in your mind as we move through Holy Week and as we uh, tell again the story of the last week of Jesus' life. May these images uh, serve to uh, help fill out the picture of all that we know and all that we believe and, and uh, as we pray through, the, through, the week, through Holy Week. Would you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for the life of Jesus. We give you thanks for the shards of memories that are available to us as we seek to reconstruct, to understand, and to incorporate his gracious life into our own. We give you thanks for this gift. In Jesus' name, amen.